Is it possible to move a car with a 9-volt battery and an electric motor? I think you can, and I think I can prove it. Crap! When I was a kid, I was playing with my Legos, and I realized that gear ratios could make a slow motor turn fast. And I wondered, can you power a car with a small electric motor and a battery? Cars wouldn't need giant engines and gas tanks. It could solve the gas crisis and even climate change. I'd be a hero. Obviously, it doesn't work this way. I was seven and an idiot. I'm 30 and I'm still an idiot, but at least I know about torque. And a motor that small doesn't provide enough of it to power a car at any kind of useful speed. Each time you increase the gear ratio, it loses torque to move faster. But the thing is, this works both ways. You can sacrifice speed for power. Instead of turning faster with each gear, you can turn stronger. Maybe strong enough to move a car, just very slowly. As much as I love them, Legos would not be enough for this project. So I had this old hobby gearbox kit. I think it's for building RC cars or something. Definitely not designed for full-sized cars, but I'd get it there eventually. So I put it together, making sure to align the gears to increase torque, soldering on a switch and battery connector, and it was here that I made my first scientific discovery of the day. If you've ever licked a 9-volt, you know that it gives a tiny jolt of electricity. The same electricity that can provide power. Connecting the motor to power and flipping the switch on causes the motor to spin. The funny thing about electric motors is that they apparently work both ways. Putting power into them makes them spin. But spinning them also generates power. So if I disconnect the battery, flip the switch on, and stick the battery connector in my mouth and give the motor a spin, feels just like licking a 9-volt. Anyways, this little motor can't pull a car even with its new gearbox. It would need more gears. The problem was, I don't know where to buy them and I don't know how to make them, so I needed to find something else that could give me the same mechanical advantage. My solution was pulleys. Lots and lots of pulleys. Just like with gears, setting up pulleys in a block and tackle can trade speed for strength. It's what they use in old sailing ships to hoist sails and lift cargo. So, sparing no expense, I bought the cheapest pulley I could find and built a platform and spool for the motor. It took a little while to keep the motor from catching or misaligning itself. And like always, zip ties saved the day and helped hold it in place. Attaching the pulley to the car was no problem. I think Toyota expects people to do experiments like this because they added a convenient loop to the frame of the car so you can tie onto. I took some of the rope that people use to make tactical friendship bracelets and tied it all together. Adding one pulley like this reduces the strength required to pull the car by half, so I flipped it on and... The bad news is that the motor immediately got stuck. The good news is that nothing broke. I was worried that the motor would be too strong and bend the frame of my car. And at this point, I realized that I was just kind of throwing crap at the wall and hoping it would stick. I had no idea how many pulleys I would need, so I performed a little test. I attached a scale to the motor to see how many pounds it could pull before it stopped. And it actually surprised me, pulling between two and a half and four pounds. I did run into a problem with the car, though. I attached the scale and began to pull, expecting to see how much weight it would take to get the car rolling when it was in neutral. The problem was, it wouldn't budge. I'd gone into this expecting it to take about 100 pounds of force to see some movement. I pulled until I could feel the rope cutting into my hands, my full weight straining against the car, and still nothing. I was sure I'd put the car in neutral, but I double checked anyways. And I had, but what I didn't do was release the parking brake. Once I fixed that, it only took about 30 pounds to pull the car. The little motor was off by a factor of 10. If I did my math right, this meant that I would need a little more than 10 pulleys in total to move the car. Now as far as I can tell, no one sells a block and tackle with 10 pulleys, because why would they? They'd just use a stronger motor. But I can't do that, because the whole point of this is to use a little motor. So I needed to make my own pulley system. Fortunately, that cheap little pulley I bought didn't come alone. For the frame, I bought these pieces of metal at a hardware store. My plan was to drill holes in them, feed bolts through, and then mount the pulleys onto the bolts. That way, I'd have nice strong metal supporting the entire thing. The problem is, apparently metal is not nearly as strong as it seems. 
To quote the late Michael Reeves, Ooga booga caveman brain, metal strong. Metal not strong. Metal more like McDonald's play place trampoline. To be clear, Michael Reeves didn't die. He just posts later and later with each video, so he's just late. Anyways, metal is weak. While drilling the holes in these two plates, I broke three screws and somehow managed to snap the end off of one of my drill bits. I didn't have an extra one, so I did my best to resharpen it. Honestly, I probably should have Googled how to do this correctly, but whatever I did seemed to work. After I carefully finished drilling the rest of the holes, I attached the bolts and pulleys and realized I'd messed up. Between an attempt to save money and time and my lack of foresight, I only made a single plate for each of the blocks of pulleys. The problem with this is that it means that the force on the pulleys causes the entire thing to pull at an angle. The ropes became misaligned and we get stuck between the pulleys, causing friction. So I went back to the store and bought two more plates. I learned from my previous attempt at drilling the holes and immediately broke another drill bit. It's always good to get that part of the process out of the way early. And the rest of the build went smoothly. I have to admit, not using two plates from the start was a dumb decision. Considering how most things I make are barely held together with zip ties and duct tape, I am genuinely proud of how these turned out. They're completely made of metal, there's no jagged edges, they almost look professional. I guess you could say that I'm something of a machinist. And as great as they look, they weren't perfect. While testing, I realized that there's so many ropes going back and forth that I couldn't get it to do anything without at least one of them getting jammed up. So I removed half of the washers so there wouldn't be any more gaps for the ropes to get stuck on. As an experienced machinist, I always recommend removing parts until your problems go away. This also applies to shaving parts off of things until they fit. Washers don't fit, shave them down. Hair getting too long, shave it down. Car won't fit in the garage, those mirrors are ornamental anyways. At this point, I knew it was ready, so I prepared for the final test. I needed the car to move, not the motor, so I filled buckets with water to weigh down the pulley system. I wanted the best chance for this to work, so to reduce weight, I pulled everything that wasn't bolted down out of my car. Tarps and blankets, spare tire, a VHS copy of the 1993 movie Free Willy. Five years ago, my brother worked at an auto body shop detailing cars. Every couple weeks, we'd make a trade. I'd make him sushi, and he'd detail my car. What was not a part of that deal was him buying a dozen VHS copies of Free Willy and hiding them in my car. Behind panels, under seats, in the glove compartment, they were everywhere. I often wouldn't find them until months after he had stashed them away. For a while, I kept a few of them where they were because it was a good prank. But a few years ago, when my car was stolen, the thieves got rid of all but one of the tapes. I think they simply just didn't find it, otherwise it would have been thrown out with the others. To this day, it lives in the console compartment of my car, along with a phone charger and a notebook. My brother tells me there are still copies I haven't found, but I don't know where they'd be. And at this point, I think I would have found them. I had pulled everything out of the car and went through every tiny compartment to find ways to reduce weight. Finally, I had one more problem to solve. I wanted to sit in the car while it was pulled because what's the point if there's no driver? The problem is, people are heavy. I could diet and dehydrate myself for the next few weeks to shed some weight, so I did the logical thing and got naked instead. I flipped the switch and got into my car. But once again, nothing happened. By the time I got into the car, the motor had stopped turning. Over the next few hours, I tinkered with the pulleys spacing them out more, changing the order that I looped the ropes, trying everything I could to reduce the friction and make it work. All I needed was an inch. And as I worked there, butt naked, trying to move a car with the motor the size of my thumb, listening to the rain softly pelt my garage door, I remembered a storm. Back when I lived in LA, I worked a weird schedule. I only had Tuesdays off because that was a slow day at the sushi place I worked at. This made it really hard to have any kind of social life, but I did have one friend with a similar schedule, and we both loved photography. So when we heard that the conditions were right for a super bloom 150 miles away in Anza Borrego, we grabbed some food and our cameras and got in my car. These desert super blooms are a rare thing. They only happen if a large enough storm rolls across the desert at the exact right time of year, bringing rain for the dormant flowers. I've always wanted to photograph one, but the desert can go years before the timing aligns just right. That year, the super bloom was incredible, though I never saw it myself. We were too early. We'd missed time to the trip. Instead, we saw something even more elusive. The storm 
that nourished the flowers. That storm terrified me. I love the rain, but this was something different. Driving on that winding desert road as night crept across the landscape, I worried we wouldn't make it home. The rain relentlessly pounded the windshield, distorting my vision. The path was unlit and poorly marked, only illuminated by my high beams and the occasional flashes of lightning. Every few minutes, a rabbit would dart across the road, panicked by the storm and my encroaching headlights. As we drove, the puddles we splashed through grew into ponds, the dry earth refusing to soak up the water. The road markers became harder to see, and I worried that we'd be caught in a flash flood or bottom out in an unseen ditch. In that moment, the full wrath of nature had been brought to bear on us in my little car. And in that moment, I was deeply afraid. But I kept driving. The music turned up to drown out the rain, my unblinking eyes fixed on the small bit of road that the downpour permitted us to see. Eventually, we made it out. And weeks later, while sorting the photos, I found one of my favorite pictures that I've ever taken. That terrifying storm just as it began to roll over the desert, bringing rain, wrath, and a super bloom I would never see. That photo hangs in my bedroom now, a memento of an adventure that didn't go as planned. I drove this car 300 miles that day. Today though, powered by nothing but a nine volt battery and an electric motor, it didn't budge a single inch. Like that day in the desert, this project didn't go as planned. Apparently, the reason they don't make blocks with this many pulleys is that they don't work. Each time the rope passes a pulley, it loses a little bit of energy to friction. Eventually, all that friction adds up and it becomes too much to work at all. No matter how many times it loops over, it will never provide enough force to pull my car, or anything else for that matter. Reducing the amount of pulleys didn't help either, because the motor was simply too weak to handle the heavier load. This experiment was a failure. I didn't power a car with a 9 volt. I didn't find a solution to the looming energy crisis. I did find a way to make a battery that you can lick forever though, so I'm calling this a win. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to support the channel, please share and subscribe. If you want to go the extra step and help fund future projects, I've set up a Patreon. You can see videos a week early and get your name added to the credits. I've also set up a Discord that's free for everyone that wants to share and talk about projects. Links are in the description.